Better late than never, I guess. Better get the hook, CT. Yeah, earn your keep, kid. This one's gonna take more than one man. Figured I could rest. Just you, Fushy. Just no offense. <laughs> you tell him, CT. Your words tonight while you're eating this baby. Here it comes. <laughs> I'll give him a break, Cal. It's a pot fish. <laughs> the rare species in these waters. It's one of those Maya pots. It's a Maya. You mean who's a Maya? They're the Indians who lived here before the Spanish conquistadors came. They built amazing city CT, like 1,500 years ago. You mean this pot's 1,500 years old? No, <laughs> they sell these in the souvenir shop. You know, there's one over by the oh, hotel. Oh, like copies. Real yeah, ones. replicas. Boy, this would be nice without this hole in it. You caught the only fish today. It didn't eat the bait. <laughs> I think we ought to be headed home, folks. Want to get your crew ready, CT? All uh, right. Uh, if you and Mr. Jeffries will help me with the stay so the wardens can get the missing. Brother, on top of everything else, I got to take orders from a 12-year-old. 13, Hold it. <laughs> no, wait a minute. Oh, uh, the guys at the shop are going to love give this one. Me Just give me that picture. Thanks for everything, CT. Sure. So, when do you go back to Ohio? Oh, not till after Christmas. Oh, that's some vacation. Thanksgiving till Christmas. Well, I'm supposed to be keeping up with my studies. <laughs> well, I'm all for it. Travel's the best education there is. Hey, CT. Here you go. You can keep your bait in it. Thanks. So long, Captain Granville. Thanks again. Goodbye. Sorry, CG. Bye. Nice folks, huh? Betting those wackos yesterday. Ugh. You must see all kinds in this business. All kinds of business. But it isn't fair. I'll decide what's fair. You decide whether you want a job or not. You know you're lucky I took you on. That's enough. I don't want to hear any more about it. Just do it. Anyhow. Say, you wouldn't by any chance know a Harold Thornton, would you? No, sorry. Sticker Thornton? Sticker Thornton? <laughs> by golly, you bet I know Sticker Thornton. 
and then more oceans and more cafes together than I'd care to. <laughs> I haven't seen him for 20 years. I'll never forget him, though. He saved my life once. He tells it the other way around. So you know Sticker, huh? He's my dad. <laughs> well, I'll be darned. Clement Granville. They call me Pepper. My grandson, C.T. Granville. Hi, C.T. Hi. So tell me, what made you stop here? Oh, I grew up on stories of Granny Granville and his wife, Mimi. And I knew you're from Gloucester. Granny? Oops. So the boat's named after your wife? That's right. She passed away about 12 years ago. Oh, I'm sorry. She was my navigator. I got a little lost when she went, but things are better now. I got a great ship made here. How long have you been crewing for your grandfather, CT? Well, five and a half days, but I learned a couple summers ago. Well, so you're new to Mexico. You'll love it. Have you checked out any of the Maya ruins yet? No, not up close, but I can't wait. I've seen some from the boat. It's nice to see you've got so much spare time, Miss Thornton. I'm sure I could give you something else to do. I'm sure you could. Captain Granville, CT, Harvey Westerman. I'll see you in the morning, then. And you see to the tanks. 2,500 pounds. Is that your boss? Real charmer, eh? He owns a string of dive boats here. You know, taking tourists to scuba dive on the reefs. I teach diving and lead the dives. Westerman keeps trying to get me to put less air in the tanks so people can't stay down so long. I ignore him. What happened to your leg? CT. Oh, it's OK. About five years ago, I had cancer. They gave me a choice, me or my leg. And you can swim at all? Uh, swimming's the easy part. But I should get going. Walk down the dock with you. You ready, CT? Right. <laughs> I'm supposed to meet someone about chartering Mimi. Maybe you know them. Terry Gibbs and Victor Cobus. Sure, I know. I've taken them diving a lot. Good people. Scientists. Scientists? Archaeologists. They stay those Maya ruins we were talking about. Victor's Mexican and Terry's from the States. I think she's into Maya pottery. Oh, yeah? Hey, uh, go on. I'll catch up. Lovely. Darling, look at this. Fantastic. Put that away. Nicholas. Is he it? Yes, darling. Captain? Agua mineral, por favor. Well, now, here's what we have in mind. Victor and I have been studying a lot of the same questions about the Maya for years. Usually, we come up with different theories. But we love to argue. Anyhow, Victor and I do agree on some things. We know the Maya traded on the ocean, for instance. Even though they thought the ocean was the underworld, sort of like hell. Wow. They paddled huge dugout canoes along the coast with goods to trade. Columbus saw one of them in the 1500s, a 70-foot canoe right off the coast of Quintana Roo. And we know that the Maya did a lot of sea trade, all during what is called the Classic Period, from 200 to 900 AD. What did they haul? Oh, many things. Corn, cloth. How about clay pots? Sure, those two. Pots. That's their specialty. And salt. They were crazy about salt. So where do we come in? Well, Victor and I decided to work on some theories together for a change. We got some money from Ina to explore Ina? this. I-N-A-H, the National Institute of Anthropology and History. Mm -hmm. I work for them. They are in charge of all the archaeology in Mexico. Mm -hmm. Ina gave us some money to look into this trade stuff more. 
we want to take a closer look at some of the ruins along the coast. By boat? Mm -hmm. We know that some of the old sites, like Tulum, were ports. We were near there today. Oh, yes? Muy bonito, no? Uh, see. Sí. Uh, and this is where we are now? Correcto. Isla Cozumel, Cozumel Island. Anyhow, Tulum here was a port. And we want to spend more time, um, how do you say, uh, snooping around under the water of these ports. Under the water? Yep. Our hypothesis is that there just might be some Maya cargo down there. Things dumped in rough weather, maybe. What if you find something? Well, it could tell us more about what was traded, where, how, and maybe even why. We're always building theories, painting new pictures of the past. But why us? I mean, why Mimi? I could hardly be considered an expert on these waters. I've only been down here for two months. You already have a fine reputation. Why not someone like that Westerman fella? He's even got dive boats. Well, to tell you the truth, Captain, El Señor Westerman is un... Well, he is... Oh, Victor, he is a first-class sleaze. Well, we can't be... Well, your own department at Ina has suspected him for years of looting, stealing Maya artifacts and selling them, which is illegal. So we'll do it, Grandpa? Well, there is one question, the diving. Can you handle the diving? Uh-oh. Do you know about it? Maybe there is someone who can help us with that. And it's a deal? It's a deal. Right. Salud. Salud. Oh, hey. I almost forgot. Maybe I already found something for you guys. Where you get this? Some guy we took fishing today caught it. I mean, instead of a fish. Oh, I see. Well, that's pretty good fishing. But I'm afraid this fish isn't very old. Well, that sure smells like it. Oh, sorry. <laughs> How do you know it is not? Well, if it had been down there for even a few months, it would have something growing on it, like algae or even coral. You can imagine what it would look like after a thousand years or so. You mean it's a fake? It's a good fake. It's a nice design. How could I get to the bottom of the ocean? Sure ask a load of questions, C.T. But it's a good question. I don't know how it got there. Tourists, maybe? I wonder what they were really like. The Maya, I mean. C.T., you ever climb around any of those ruins? Nope, not yet. Captain Granville, Victor and I have to go back to Palenque to pick up our gear. I know this sounds strange since you hardly know me. But if CT wants to come along, I'd be glad to take him. We can show him the ruins. They're spectacular. Can I, Grandpa? I have an 11-year-old who'd get along great with CT. I'm teaching her myself for a while. That's really very nice of you, but... Well, we do not need to decide this now. We don't leave for two days. Can I, Grandpa? I'll understand it if you don't want me to go with them tomorrow. Even though it would be a real educational experience. If Mom promised the principal you'd give me. Of course, if you don't, I might have to let a few people know about that uh, nickname of yours. Granny. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I don't want to go. I don't want to go. in Jackson Hole, Wyoming. I'm here for the National Disabled Ski Championships. And guess who one of the racers is? Pepper. Only in real life, I'm Martha Hill, member of the United States Disabled Ski Team. Glad you could join us. Each year for 15 years now, thousands of skiers with all kinds of disabilities have competed for the chance to ski in the national championships. This year, 140 of us have made it here to ski for the title, best in the country. They picked a good place for us to try to prove it. Jackson Hole has some of the toughest ski slopes in the world. 
For me, it's a real challenge. For me, any ski slope's a real challenge. But the people here seem to like to be challenged, no matter what their disability. I think it's because we don't like to think of ourselves as unable just because we're disabled. Sort of like Armada says, if I can do this, I can do anything. That's it. Come on, you got it. You don't have to go above it. That's right, I just have to break the plane, don't I? That's right. Is that it broke? Let's see your goal. Go, go, come on. This is the downhill course for blind skiers. That's right, blind skiers. The way they get down is they have a partner who can see, skiing in front of them, yelling directions back to them so they know where they're going. Watch. Talk about trusting someone with your life. A lot of the time, the seeing partner doesn't have to say anything. The blind skier just listens for the sound of the skis as they turn in front of him. This competition is really important to Martha. She has a chance to be named the best all-around skier in her class and then go on to represent the United States at the World Championships in Sweden. She's already won two out of the three events. Here she is winning the slalom race. This is my favorite event. I like all the quick turns. I'm glad I've done well so far. But tomorrow's downhill, and that's the toughest. After her afternoon practice, Martha introduced me to some of her friends and fellow competitors. Do you compete with each other? We sure do. Every day. <laughs> <laughs> we may be in different categories. Like Martha and I are both on one leg. Uh -huh. And she skis on outriggers, I ski on poles, but we're in the same class. Landis is below the knee amputee. And uh, she skis on two skis with poles. But we're all out to beat each other no matter what the <laughs> class is. Does it bother you guys when people talk about or ask you about your amputations? I think it depends on how it's asked. And in, in what light and in what situation. And of course, everybody's different. No, I'd prefer people to ask than to sit back and just stare and you know, go, oh, look yeah, at that person over there. And all of us are usually just as curious about each other's disabilities mm -hmm. as other people are. I mean, we'll sit mm -hmm. around the dinner table, and I remember mm -hmm. sitting after one of our training camps with six other people on the team, and we were finding out, you know, what happened to each person, and how'd you, you, know, how'd how'd you, you lose you your leg, how'd you lose your arm, what kind of, did you have a disease, did you have an accident? So. We're just like the rest of you because Martha is different to me. She's, her handicap, even though it looks to be the same, she's gone through different things, and so I want to know what it was like for her. Uh -huh. Martha and I became good friends while we filmed the second Voyage of the Mimi. But she never really told me how much she's been through. Can you hand me my leg? Oh, yeah. <laughs> you ever seen me put this on before? Uh, not really, not in close. Lots. It's pretty interesting. This light stays on by a suction socket. And what you do is you end up, you put this around your stump, and then you pull it through here. And then once it's all the way through, you'll close up the hole with this valve here. What do you mean suction? Well, it stays on by pulling my stump into there and closing up the valve. No air can get in there, and then it's able to hold the leg on without any kind of extra assistance. Like it makes a vacuum, maybe? Mm-hmm. And then this was, uh, they ended up taking a cast of my leg, and they formed this to the leg. And it's a soft socket, so when my muscles um, contract and expand, it conforms with it. And it fits a lot better that way. And that's why, and also it's a soft plastic, so like with uh, down in Mexico, it being so hot, I didn't have any problems sort of keeping the suction because I was able, you know, I gave some. Right, My other socket used to be a real hard type of socket and I always came out of it with the hot weather and stuff. Uh -huh. So what I end up doing is I put this sock around my stump. Do you have a bone in your stump? Yeah, I do. The bone ends about right here. 
-hmm. And then um, what they did is they wrapped all my muscles around the bone so that um, I still had the strength. Like this leg is seven pounds. And so this, that much of my bone to my hip is lifting up seven pounds every time I step. And so with that muscle strength, I'm able to move a lot of weight. I'll put this over my stump. And then I put this through the hole. And then pull it through. And then I just cover up the hole. That's what? my skin right there. Uh, I cover up the hole to close off the section so that no air can get in there. And then the leg will stay on so it can lift it up. Uh -huh. And this is, um, I don't know if you noticed when you handed it to me, but the leg I had, well, that's the leg I had in, on the Mimi. Uh -huh. And uh, this one is a different kind. It's got a knee joint, which the one I used for the Mimi didn't. So it follows through. And it's also soft. You can feel that if you want. Yeah, it's like foam. Mm -hmm. So I shape it to my other leg. It looks just like it. Yeah, pretty neat. What did you What did you think when you first found out you had cancer? Did you know you're gonna have to lose your leg? Um, yeah, actually I did because it was a uh, really rare. Well, actually, when they first told me I had cancer, they weren't sure what kind I had, but they were pretty sure they were gonna have to amputate. And um, when I did find, or when I went in for my exploratory, where they were trying to decide or find out what kind of cancer I had, they found it was malignant and it was a real rare kind. And I was treated at um, Mayo Clinic. And I was their 28th case of my type of cancer. And at the time that they discovered what I had, 26 had died and the 27th wasn't doing very well. And so they decided not to amputate. Because in every case, they'd amputated right away. And uh, instead, they started me on radiation the next day, which I had for six weeks. And they started me on chemotherapy like two weeks later. And um, within three weeks, I knew there was no way they could save my leg. And so I was, by the time they finished the radiation, I was ready to get rid of it because I had always been really active and I was mm -hmm. just carrying around a lot of dead weight. So it was really a deteriorated because of all the radiation? Yeah. Was? Well, the knee, my knee was about, was about that big. And I couldn't, it had atrophied, the muscles had atrophied, so that's about as straight I could get it. And I couldn't put any weight on it. And it was basically, the tumor was all over the place and it was just strangling the whole leg. So I was ready to get rid of it when it came time to get rid of it. But I had already known for two months that they probably would amputate, so it made it a lot easier, I think. Uh -huh. Were you scared at all that you might die? I mean, all those people? Um, I, I knew that it was pretty serious. I didn't know all the statistics, actually, um, uh -huh. when they, they only gave me a 30% chance of living that year out, and I never knew that until like four years later. Wow. And, um, but I did know that I was really sick because I remember at one point um, when I was filling out my hospital menu, I was kind of laughing because I really didn't know whether I was going to be there the next day to eat it or not. But um, suddenly all uh, my treatments started taking and stuff and I knew I wasn't going to die and just I started getting better and better and <laughs> I've been fine ever since. Well, I mean, um, that, that's a big, like, wound. I mean, does it, do you have any pain from it at all anymore? I get um, something called phantom pains because when they amputated, um, I still had all the nerves. And I have all the nerve endings. And so every now and then, I can feel my toes. Um, like right now, I can feel my big toe and my second toe and my baby toe. And uh, every now and then, I can also feel my tumor in my knee. But it's usually um, if I'm really tired, the nerves will start acting up or if I um, jam my stump really hard. Uh-huh. And by feel it, you mean that you can, you mean it, it feels like they're hurting? It feels like it's there? They feel like they're asleep. You know, that tingling oh, really? sensation you get? Wow, that must be really weird. <laughs> they really don't know why I ever got it, and they don't know why I'm still here, but I'm just happy to be here. <laughs> and I give up yeah. a leg to stay here. <laughs> wow, that's so, really, really That made it easier, too, you know. When it comes down to life and a limb, yeah, there really, really isn't a comparison as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. This is the start of the downhill course for skiers who can ski standing up. This is where Martha's going to be racing. Get right back to me as far as and wind. We added this I sure wouldn't go down there.
The final and most dangerous event of the competition is the downhill race. If Martha finishes well here, she can win the overall championship, but it won't be easy. Skiers can reach 60 miles an hour on the course, and a lot of them fall. Martha's fallen, too, on both her practice runs. She must be pretty nervous. the most dangerous part of the downhill. Martha should be coming down here any second. enough to win the title. She's the national champion. And the gold medal to our own resident movie star, Martha Hill. <laughs> Close to suntan on her leg there. Put it down in Cozumel. Congratulations. <laughs> this was a special accomplishment for me. Now I have to start training for the world championship. And I have to start figuring out how to get down this mountain once. You'll get it. You've done great.